I noticed that people were just focusing. I think we had it from the 80s, women or people in general were just like on a fat-free diet. And then it became about carb-free and then it became about gluten-free and then it became about sugar-free. And then it's like everyone was just focusing on what to avoid and no one was focusing on what we actually need to eat. And we actually need to eat quite a lot. Hi, my name is Dr. Rongan Chatterjee, medical doctor, author of The Four Pillar Plan and television presenter. I believe that all of us have the ability to feel better than we currently do but getting healthy has become far too complicated. With this podcast, I aim to simplify it. I'm going to be having conversations with some of the most interesting and exciting people, both within as well as outside the health space, to hopefully inspire you, as well as empower you with simple tips that you can put into practice immediately to transform the way that you feel. I believe that when we are healthier, we are happier, because when we feel better, we live more. Hello and welcome back to my Feel Better, Live More podcast. Or if you're a first-time listener, thank you for joining me. Feedback to last week's episode with Rich Roll on how to find your purpose has been simply incredible to see online and I'm delighted that by sharing Rich's story, it's inspired many of you to make some changes in your own life and it's also helped redefine what you thought might be possible. Now, before we get into today's conversation, I'm pleased to announce a partnership with Athletic Greens, who are sponsoring today's show. I know that many of you are really enjoying this podcast and look forward to each weekly episode. In order to support the time and expense it takes to put these podcasts on, I've taken on a sponsor whose vision is really well aligned with my own to help people feel better so that they can get more out of life. As you know, I believe that the right nutrition is an essential ingredient to having a healthy and happy life. There's no question that I prefer people to get their nutrition from eating food, but these days that can be a little bit challenging for many of us. You might be busy, on the go, rushing around, and even with the best intentions, some days it can be a little bit tricky to cook a wholesome, nutritious meal. If you feel that this might apply to you, and you want to take something each morning as a bit of an insurance policy to make sure that you are meeting your nutritional needs, I can highly recommend Athletic Greens. It's a super tasty whole food greens powder that you can take each morning, and unlike most green supplements that I have tried in the past, it tastes fantastic. In fact, my kids absolutely love it. I love the company Ethos, and I have to say that it is unquestionably one of the most nutrient-dense whole food supplements that I have come across. For listeners of this podcast, if you go to athleticgreens.com forward slash live more, you'll be able to access a special offer where you will get a free travel pack box with 20 servings of Athletic Greens, which is worth about £70 with your first order. So guys, if you are interested in this, do go to that URL, athleticgreens.com forward slash live more. Now, on to today's conversation. So guys, I'm really excited for today's episode with a really good friend of mine, uh, someone you guys have probably heard of, if not already have got one of her books. It is the amazing nutritional therapist and best-selling author, Amelia Freer. Amelia, welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much, Rangan. It's lovely to be here. Amelia, I think the best thing for me about having you on the podcast is that we've not seen each other for a while no. and we get to catch up in person. I know, it's lovely. You've obviously been very, very busy. You've had a baby girl. I have, my lovely Willow. Yes, it's uh, utterly life-changing. <laughs> I'm sure it has been, you know, and I'm sure we'll get into that in, in our conversation. But how long ago is that now since she gave birth? Uh, so she's actually going to be one next week. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's just flown by. Where's the time gone? I know. I well, feel you're... like the last kind of two years, I just have sort of been locked in, in a different world, a baby bubble. <laughs> and has, has it been challenging? Incredibly, incredibly yeah. challenging. I mean, absolutely amazing. But uh, I just, yeah, incredibly challenging. Wow. Well, look, I, I look forward to hearing a bit more about yeah. that later on in the conversation. Um, but Amina, you're very well known as a fantastic nutritional therapist and your books have done incredibly well. I'm a huge fan of your books, particularly Thank the last you. book, I've got to say. Um, Nourish and Glow, the 10-day plan is brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I wonder whether a good starting point of this conversation is for you to talk about you know, your evolution over the three books that you've written, sure. which culminates in this gorgeous thing called the Positive Nutrition Pyramid, which I think is brilliant. Oh, thanks, Rangan. That's great. Um, well, yeah, so I've been a nutritional therapist now for uh, over 10 years. 
And um, I, I always say to people, you know, you can study nutritional therapy. For me, it was a four year course. I had to study all of the sciences first and then do the nutritional therapy. But really, the learning happens when you start working with clients. And uh, that, that's taken me on an immense journey. I've been really fortunate to have a sort of thriving practice from quite early on, just because I think I'm a people person and I enjoy that interaction with people. Um, and uh, my first book really came out of trying to share what I had found to be the most important or useful tools that I discussed and worked on with my clients uh, in, in practice. So it's really practical things from like changing, uh, you know, getting your kitchen sorted out and making sure that you've got the right things, the positive things, as opposed to the things that you're trying to maybe reduce in your, in your life. Um, I, I remember doing a chapter on make fat your friend and sugar your enemy and um, just trying to get people to sort of become more aware of the role that nutrition plays in their health and well-being. Um, and that was that book was like six years ago now. Wow. Um, my second book was uh, I, I hadn't really provided recipes in the first book and everyone just said look we get it we want to eat better we we understand what to do but we just need help with uh how to actually make it a reality in the kitchen so the second book was purely a cookbook um with lots lots and lots of different recipes and i tried to sort of put them into different categories like recipes for on the go because i know that most people struggle with how to prepare a healthy lunch or uh and i had something called the naughty chapter which in hindsight i, I slightly regret the choice of the title but i was just trying to make people aware that even if things are sort of nat natural sugars, healthy sugars, we still need to be conscientious of the amount of foods that we consume. So uh, anyway, that that was that cookbook. And then my third book came out last year. And I think it's the book that I'm the most proud of because it came about from just learn, you know, watching what's happening in the health and wellness industry, uh, watching how well people have responded to healthy eating and the importance of nutrition but also observing that there was a, a, a slightly negative shift in the culture and that people were really focusing on what not to eat. And it was starting to become about deprivation. And I think that there was starting to become quite a negative undertone to what I think should be an incredibly joyful and positive process. Um, so the 10 day plan, although it's called the 10 day plan, that's just a marginal part at the end of the book where I've provided a 10 day plan for people to just dip in, get stuck in and actually feel what it's like to eat well, shop well, cook well for 10 days. And I always believe that after 10 days, people have pretty much got that they feel incredible and that, that you know, it's, it's, it's a platform for them to then make it, make it their own going forward. And that's key, isn't it? Getting them to feel better because, you know, I, I think, you know, as a doctor, when I'm trying to make changes with my patients, I don't think long term they're going to follow what I asked them to do because I told them to. Mm. I think I've got to get them to feel it for themselves and then they're sort of bought in. And I guess that's what you're saying. That tiny plan almost gets them to show them how quickly they can feel well. You're so right. And actually, I think it was the best bit of advice I was ever given by another nutritional therapist. Um, something that I do, do in my practice and do in clinic with clients is the advice that I give them is the thing that's going to help them feel best fastest. Yeah. Because So it might not be the, all of the things that they need to do, but it's how can I make a difference to this person's life within the next three to four weeks so that then they actually are, are more open, they're, more, they're feeling more positive, maybe they're feeling more energized, they're the symptoms have disappeared a little bit and then they're more engaged and more positive about the bigger picture, the, the you know, the, the longer process. And so, yeah, that's what I do in practice, but that's certainly what the 10-day plan was aiming to achieve. But the rest of the book really tackles, um, I suppose it sort of touch, I mean, I'm not a, an, an emotional therapist, but it touches because obviously in my work, the emotions are so tied up in how people eat and their relationship with food. And so I try to touch on the, the sort of most complex issues that people find when trying to make healthy living a way of life, because we know lots of people can be healthy for a week or they can say, right, for January, I'm going to give up everything. Yeah. And and we know that that doesn't really last long term or, or make a big impact on, on their health and well-being. So I tried to touch on all of the different areas from from our social networks, uh, from our own self worth, and from our own self sabotage or sabotage of, of others. That sort of. I mean, that's so important, isn't it, Amelia? Because you know, I think my my own thinking, like from what I could tell from talking to you, has, has evolved over a number of years. You know, what we might have thought five years ago. Yes, a lot of it is still valid today, but often we modify it, we tweak it, and, and we learn more things. And I'm yeah. like, you're always learning from my patients. And sometimes you think, oh, this is the way to do it. And a patient will do it another way and they'll come back and I'll be like, 
Well, that's interesting. You know, I didn't yeah. think of that. That's... I think one of the most frustrating things about practice is there's there's that part of me that wants the comfort zone of just saying, right, this is my formula, this is how to work, and 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 then I can relax and know that this is what I do with everyone. And I think that lots of people maybe do practice that way, but I think uh, you know we we know that that's not possible with a, a, an evolving science like nutrition. So I have had to, you know, it's frustrating and it's hard because I'm constantly changing how I work. I'm constantly learning new things learning things that made me sort of second guess what I did you know five years ago and oh it, it you know the, the more you know the less you know right absolutely but yeah. I don't think it's just nutrition you know Amelia because I could say the same thing about medicine you know I think a lot of what we're asked to do now with our patients is quite protocol driven mm. it's like okay if patient comes in with x symptom and has got x diagnosis this is the treatment plan yes. and I've realized more and more particularly the last five or six years that Actually, that symptom or that diagnosis can have multiple different causes. So, you know, someone coming in with, I don't know, let's say depression, for example, that can be multiple different drivers. Yeah. So the treatment plan for an individual patient is going to be different. Whether yeah, whether their, their label may be the same, but the treatment is going to be different. Yeah, absolutely. It would be nice, wouldn't it, to be able to stay in our comfort zones of just having protocols for everything. But but I've certainly learned that that's an, that's it's not a way that I'm able to work. So so what have you seen? I know you 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 do talk about this in, in your latest book. What are some of these issues that you see in clinic that that the, these emotions, if you will, that are tied up in their food choices that you also have to tackle? So it's not just about saying oh, you need to eat this, more of this and less of that, you have to tackle some of the other areas. It's, of, it's often the f that food is the, is the last thing that we talk about. You know, not with everyone, it just it, it depends everyone. Every situation is entirely unique, uh, as is every person. But uh, I suppose what I noticed a lot was I was getting, um, it's mostly women in my practice, uh, but but I do see some men, but I, but I was getting a lot of really successful women who are driven, stressed, busy, they're high achievers, and they want to have all areas of their life completely sorted. And food was the one area that they just couldn't manage to get control of. And so they would often be, um, you know, eating well, going to the gym, managing millions of tasks. But then at the end of the day, eating a packet of Doritos or or, or more or drinking a bottle of wine or, or what have you. So that's something that I saw a lot of. And I remember speaking to, uh, actually, uh, you've had him on your podcast, William Pullen. Oh, yeah. um, I chatted to, to William and I was like, look, what do I do? I need, I need, I don't have the skills to deal with this because it's not really about the food. This, this seems to be a deep emotional issue. And I, I need to find a therapist who who specializes in this area and can guide me or guide my patient my clients um, in the right direction and he connected me with a fantastic therapist who specializes in eat all forms of eating disorders so i very quickly learned where i had to spot the red flag or where i couldn't actually help people so a lot of people that you know you could see had the potential for an eating disorder or or some kind of you know, uh, d disordered relationship with with their food or health, and uh, I would get them in for a few sessions with her first before we even tackled the food. And I then learned a lot from her, and 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 started reading a lot and delving into all of the different areas of 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 stress and and how uh, you know we're so embedded in in our habits and our, and sometimes it can be our family that challenge us. Yeah, and they're they're all interwoven, aren't they? I know you know that I I talk about these four pillars all the time. The Food, movement, sleep, and relaxation, mm. but they're they're not really separate. They're all kind of interwoven with each other. And you change one thing, and automatically changes another thing. But I think you're, you're bringing up a really interesting point, Amelia, which I think I don't think gets spoken about enough. You know, even on social media, which is you know why do people make the food choices that they make? We're, we're often saying, oh, you know, in order to help type two diabetes, you need to do it this way, or you know, people know what to do. They're just not doing a good job of it. And I don't particularly resonate with that kind of messaging because, you know, at the coalface, seeing real people with real lives, there are so many complex issues behind why people make those food choices. Yes. And often there are emotional issues to process first. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I mean, for yeah, I kind of feel that I'm saying it more and more and more is encouraging people to not be afraid of uh, exploring their emotional well-being. And I think it's something, uh, maybe it's quite British, that uh, a lot of people, are just, they just don't want to go there. And it is a fearful 
thing to to delve into our emotional health and maybe look at ourselves in 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 a, in a challenging way. It's hard work, but I think I always say it takes a brave person to do that kind of work. But I think it's actually maybe at the crux of of everything. And I know. Um, a nutritional therapist colleague of mine, um, Dana James in the States. She's written a brilliant book and she's she's gone on from, we studied together in London and she's gone on to learn cognitive behavioural therapy and uh, and she, she really hammers home this message. I think she and I probably so, see quite similar clients. She hammers home this message that, you know, ultimately it's it's about our self-worth and and that's what we need to look at. And I and I, I just couldn't agree more. In, in many ways, it's it's the root of the root. Yeah. You know, we're. I know me and you are both into trying to trying to discover what's the root cause of why mm. your clients or my patients turn up that mm. and, and are struggling. You know, what is that root cause? And again, I'd say for me, it's evolved in the, even in the last years. And I think emotions and stress are right up there, particularly these days in the 21st century. Yeah. When, you know, what, what did we say when we, you know, we met up, grabbed a quick drink before this podcast mm. and we haven't seen each other. I don't think I've seen you since you... I think I was at very early stages pregnant. Yeah, so it's been a little while. Yeah. And, you know, the, the the classic, you know, intro and, and sort of greeting these as, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, just a little bit busy. You know, everyone says that. How many times each day do you hear that? Or do we say we're busy or we hear yeah. people are busy? And I think we've really got to start talking about this because if we are fundamentally busy the whole time, have no time to look at ourselves and understand why we're doing what we're doing, I think we compensate for that with our lifestyle choices a lot yeah. of the time, which is why so many people can have a brilliant two weeks or three weeks on a eating plan of some sort, mm. but then they just fall off the wagon because the underlying because the foundations cause, aren't yeah. in place. And I, I'm glad you bring it up actually, because I mean it, this this is quite personal for for me. But uh, you know, I did three books uh, back to back, and and my practice really took off, and and life became quite busy and, and really exciting and I was offered some amazing opportunities but maybe they were things that I wasn't really I didn't really have all of the tools to know how to handle it all it wasn't something that I'd been actively seeking and uh, I I sort of had to take a step back and, and observe myself my own well-being because I, I know that I'm naturally more of an introvert I'm not someone that thrives on being in you know public speaking or being in, in groups of people but yet I was sort of because I had all these opportunities that I didn't really know how to say no to and I thought I should be grabbing them all I, I took myself quite far out of my comfort zone and, I, and it definitely had an impact on my overall health and a couple of years ago I really decided okay I've just I've just got to step back I've got to go listen to me and for me that's spending time in nature and as you know I grow my own vegetables yeah. and um, just sort of actually being truthful and being in tune with myself and, and saying okay I'm not going to go to every lecture I'm not going to fly back and forth to America five times a year to go to the IFM conferences <laughs> which that, I was yeah. doing for a few years uh, and just just you know losing that sleep and obviously as you know because I was I, I was also growing a baby and wanted to make sure that I was you know present and and alert and healthy and, and around for my baby so that meant that I had to make some quite big decisions and turn down a lot of work and 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 exciting opportunities in my career but how, how have you found that because I'm, I'm sure there's going to be people listening to this who are in their own lives feeling similar things they're feeling overwhelmed they're seeing all these amazing things on social media that everyone in their community seems to be doing, yet mm. they've got, you know, they're, they're stuck doing what they're doing, they're busy, um, you know, they might have children, so they feel, I can't keep going off to all these conferences, I just yeah. don't have the time to do that. Yeah. You know, how did you find that? I mean, do you still get FOMO, fear of missing out? Um, I don't think I do. No, I don't think that's I great. do, because I think that I'm, ha I'm a lot happier that I've taken some time out and it, I feel... Like, um, as, as I said to you earlier, I'm just emerging from my baby fog, um, 11 months of very little sleep. Um, and, and, and I feel kind of a bit, you know, I've, I've renewed my energy and uh, I've renewed my thoughts and my creativity. And I'm looking forward to getting back into practice and getting back into work. But doing it with w my quality of life comes first. Yeah. And I think as practitioners, we have to practice that. And that's what we said when we met up before uh, doing this was, you know, you're, you're, you're busy, you're, you're taking on all these things. And it's like, rah, rabbit in the headlights. How do I, how do I manage it all? How do I balance it all? It's all exciting and incredible stuff. But I know that you're a family man. And ultimately I, I, am, that's... And I think that one of the things I've always resonated with you on is, A, I love how you come across on social media. It's always, to me, very measured. It's, it's not, I don't know. It's it's very kind, compassionate. I've always liked your tone. I think it, I think it's absolutely fantastic, and I think it's something to be really aware of these days in 
because I think social media, you know, again, I'm not demonizing it. I use it. I love social media, but I think it can be very toxic. I, yeah, I, I'm, I, I have a love hate relationship with it. I, I, I do use it and I think that it can be an incredibly positive community and I can definitely have days where I get amazing inspiration from it. But I do worry a lot about how it's used, um, how, how some people are using it, how influencers are yeah. using it and, uh, and just how it can make normal people feel pretty rubbish about themselves if they're having a bad day and 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 I sometimes I you know if I'm a bit tired which I have been lately or I'm just having a bad day which we all do and I look at, at Instagram and suddenly it's telling me how to be it's telling me that I should be laughing or I should be dancing or I should be exercising or I should be eating this or I and it's like whoa sometimes I just think we need to remember that it's just an app <laughs> yeah and the whole thing with it's social not. media is it's 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 this whole concept of perfectionist presentation that we we present that perfect side of us on social media. Yeah. Um, and even if you know it's not real, your brain is still seeing it. Your brain is still yes. constantly getting yes. fed that information. And I think most of what our brain picks up is subconscious anyway. So actually, I think it can be incredibly toxic. And you know, you you know, you mentioned I'm a family man. I am, and one of the, you know, someone says to me the other day, oh, wrong, and you've got to be on Insta stories more. And I'm thinking. <laughs> You know what? I know I could do, and I could have more followers. Yeah, but, but it why? really doesn't drive me. You know, I'm I, I value that time I've got with my children or my yes. wife. Yeah, and you know something I feel quite strongly about. And again, I'm not criticising people who do this. And you've always, yes, it's no, such a know, delicate area. <laughs> but I genuinely, when I'm with my children, that's at weekends or in the evenings, I don't want to model the behaviour to them that every part of our life has to be snapped yes. and broadcast. Yes. I'm tempted sometimes. I'm yeah. sure occasionally I have done it. So I, I struggle with it uh, as much um, yes. as anyone. Yeah. But I've really made this sort of vow to myself that my children's well-being is more important. Mm. And it sounds obvious, but I've just reiterated to myself that their well-being is more mm. important than anything I do in public, more important than what I do on social media. Mm. And that is always my first thing. If that means I don't post for a few days or I don't post on Insta stories, so be it. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I'll just enjoy that time. I think well, and, and I think that that's that's so healthy and balanced, and and I don't want to model and, it with our, with, yes. you know, with, with our. We've got a lot of followers, and I kind of want to try and model that behaviour yes, where I can. Absolutely, I, I agree with you. You can easily get caught up, and I mean, gosh, you know, the amount of times with my little baby that I would sort of be distracted by reading a post or reading a blog, and suddenly realise, oh my god, she's looking at me, and I'm looking at the phone, and. Uh, I wait think, till they get a bit older. They will. They, oh. I tell you, kids will start to call you out on it. If you are yeah. playing with them and you're distracted, yeah. You know, my daughter once said to me, "This is a couple of years ago. It wasn't to do with a phone actually. I think it was just thinking about work or something, and yeah. I just had lots of deadlines." Yeah. She says, "Daddy, you're not here, really, are you?" Oh. And I tell you, there's nothing brings you back to earth yes. more than that. And I'm like, okay, right, you're 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 absolutely spot it's on. Really hard. Um, but yeah, so this is something I guess we can talk about a lot, and this probably feeds into people's lifestyle choices a lot. Mm. Um, but if we just bring it back onto foods, yes. <laughs> um, you are obviously an expert in nutrition, and you know. When you have seen, in your experience, patients, sorry, I know you call them clients. I'm, clients I can't, for me, yes. yeah, when, you, when you see your clients yes. in clinic, what are some of the common problems that you see? And then, you know, what are some of those solutions that you can give them? Because I know lots of people will be listening to this and thinking, mm. oh, you know, I want to learn, I want mm. to learn some tips on nutrition from Amelia. So I wonder what, what you've learned in the clinic that can help our listeners today. Sure. I think I've, I've, I've really seen all sorts and, and it's, it, I've often been, thinking I must try and find an area to specialize in like lots of women specialize in hormonal health or and I and I have never been quite able to do it because I've always had such a wide variety of, of people come to see me um, I suppose gut health uh, digestion and um, that's actually what got me into nutrition in the first place um, can, we, and, can we just delve into that a minute sure. what, what did get you into nutrition I think that would be super fascinating for people so I remember as a young girl um, I, I'd say probably, you know, I'm talking eight years old, I would always have a tummy ache and uh, I would never quite be able to get to the bottom of this tummy ache. And uh, in my teenage years, I mean, I didn't, I wouldn't say I ate a, a, a bad diet. You know, my mum cooked from scratch every day, but, you know, we probably ate cereal for breakfast. And uh, if I could have, I would have lived on sweet cups of tea and Marmite on toast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't that into food. Um uh, I, I, in my teenage years, I had really bad acne, and it was really 
it was it was awful. Uh, and then I moved to London uh, in my early 20s and started working. And uh, lots of people have heard me talk about this before, but I kind of really binged on on junk food. I just loved that I had access to junk food. I thought it was really sophisticated to have a croissant for breakfast and a baguette for lunch. And I kind of went for it. Again, I wasn't connected with what I, how what I was eating was impacting my health and my digestive you know, health that hadn't been great for, you know, I'd had these pains from when I was eight years old. It just, it got worse and worse. And um, I, I I always say I just wasn't a vibrant girl. You know, I, I'd always dreamt of coming to the bright lights in the big city. And then there I was, and I was just exhausted, unwell, in pain, you know, bad skin. Um, I had taken quite a few courses of the drug Rakutane for my acne, which I now know Having, obviously having understood nutrition and understanding what these drugs do, uh, I now n- know the pattern of, of, of what went wrong with my health from, you know, digestive uh, digestive health, etc. Um, I, I went to lots of doctors. I was offered, um, you know, the standard medications that doctors have available to them to offer for the symptoms that I was presenting, but antidepressants, antispasmotic uh, drugs and uh, pain relief. Um, Did they work? And... and no. no. Well, I didn't take antidepressants because I didn't, I, in my heart, I didn't feel that that was the underlying issue for sure. me. Um, and, and and I suppose that was probably the time when that real burning of why started to happen with me. And, you know, I, 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 I remember then connecting with my, my father, uh, sadly died when I was a young girl, when I was nine. Um, but he was quite alternative and he did yoga in the the early 1980s and he practiced nutrition and uh, homeopathy and I hadn't really obviously because he died I didn't really pay much attention to it but I remember starting to connect with with that and starting to think there must be other solutions here because why do I why am I the only one with acne why am I the only one with this sore tummy and compared to your friends and your community friends and colleagues and everything yeah so so that that's a long a long story but I I ended up discovering hearing about nutritional therapy and I went to see a nutritional therapist and it was for me just wow absolutely uh I I was I was fascinated do you remember what 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 were those wow moments what did that nutritional therapist say to you that that had such a big impact. I remember her talking me through the digestive system and explaining what goes on, which is something I had never, ever thought about. Wow. Um, and she she just explained it in a really straightforward way. She explained blood sugar balance, which, uh, you know, once you get it, you're like, oh, OK. Uh, and and she, she really highlighted to me what my diet consisted of, which was beige foods and high, high, high sugar. Um and so it, it just it just kind of made sense when was she, it hard when she to make change? To me. Yes, very. I mean, I was I was very resistant, uh, reluctant. I didn't want. I, I liked the way that I ate, and <laughs> and uh, uh, we were talking about coffee earlier. You know, I really I really was addicted to sweet tea, and to to give up sugar and tea was major for me. You say sweet tea. So how I would many? Have three teaspoons of sugar. Three in my teaspoons. Tea, okay. Wow. And I would have about ten cups of tea a day. Oh wow. Oh, I know, so stupid, right? But uh, I don't mean to say stupid as a judgment, but like now looking back, I can't believe that I was that. But that's the norm for many people. Yeah, yeah. And did you, you know, when you first started seeing a nutritional therapist, did you really think in your heart, okay, my, my digestive problems, my skin problems are going to get better by changing what I eat? Um, I had a really good friend who had who, who had been on a bit of a nutritional journey, and I'd seen that she was in a very positive place. So there was a little little bit of me thinking, I want some of that. But um, I was probably quite dubious, uh, if I'm honest. And you know, like I say, I you know, it's uncomfortable changing our habits, and I wanted to carry on eating the foods that I was eating, and I didn't want to be weird and 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 strange with my food choices. Which you know, we're talking. 15 years ago wow. when I started and, you know, there was not the wide availability that there is now of, of healthy options. Um, so, so I remember you... buying sandwiches and scooping out the insides and having them in like some lettuce. So it's not as easy as it was it now. Was no, yeah, as it, it is yes, now. Yes, yeah. exactly. Because I think, well, I don't know if it is everywhere. I notice it. I don't live in London. I am often in London and I find it pretty easy to eat healthily when I'm in London. Actually, there's such mm. a vast array of choice now yes um but i don't find that everywhere you know i don't find that you you still can everywhere even though there's a growing awareness of this it's still hard to buy convenience food that's actually got it right yeah so you basically had some health problems you tried everything medically 
available wasn't really helping. You'd heard about nutritional therapy. You went to see a nutritional therapist. Mm -hmm. You made some changes. And digestion and skin got better? Uh, so I think it was my skin that improved rapidly. And that wow. was just, you know, as a young girl in her, in London, you know, that was really important to me. I, I, I was deeply uncomfortable about my skin. And so that was that was the thing that I noticed the first. Then I suppose it was digestion, then it was energy, and it was just a, a ripple effect. But but by then I was I was hooked. And you were hooked. I remember I I I just left my job and I went to India to learn yoga. And uh, it was there that I was actually chatting with a doctor and I was sort of saying, you know, I'm, I'm not re I'm not really sure what to do with my life. And I'm kind of interested in nutrition, but there's no way I could be a nutritionist. There's no way I could do that. And she she sort of talk, talked me through it for a while. And she said, you know, what are the things that you that you're always drawn to if you're looking through a magazine. I was like, oh, it's always recipes and food. And, <laughs> and she's like, I think this is your calling. <laughs> so wow. I, I remember coming back to London and enrolling on the course. I mean, I, there wasn't many courses at the time that did uh, anything to do with nutrition. So I studied at the Institute for Optimum Nutrition, which um, was, for me, I, I loved it. It was, loved it, it was, it, I just remember being there. I didn't tell many people I was doing it just in case it was a complete disaster <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but uh, within the first few few days I knew that I was absolutely in the right place and I mean it was still quite self-motivated I was still doing it I didn't ever envisage having a career in it I was doing it for me and I because I wanted to learn it and, and get my health completely on track a, a lot of nutrition therapists I spoke to or even you know medical doctors who are embracing you know nutrition and lifestyle as a way as, as, a, as a as a way of treating their patients I find more often than not, they've had a personal experience. They've had some yes. reason to challenge to, and question the norms, some reason that either for their own health or someone close to them that has forced them to go, well, let me try a different way. And then they're the ones who want to sing it from the, shout it from the rooftops because yes. they've started to feel the difference themselves. Yes. I think it feels really important for me that I've had that experience. And I, I, I feel like it makes me a more empathetic practitioner because I've been there, I've made the changes, I've experienced it firsthand. And I'm not just sort of going and going, oh, yeah, I've heard about this, try it. Yeah. And you know how hard it is because I think a lot of people will be able to resonate with that. You know, they're, they don't want to necessarily change the way they eat. They mm. like the way they eat, but they don't like their symptoms. Exactly. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's pretty incredible, actually. So you've been on that journey. So as a nutrition therapist in clinic, you know, are there some common themes that you see over and over again that maybe we could discuss that are going to help some of the listeners actually understand what they might be able to do to change things in their own life? I, I think that a, a lot of people come to see me with the same sort of four or five things. It's It's... They're busy, they're working really hard, they're very stressed, they have digestive symptoms, they're probably not sleeping enough, and um, there's often that emotional battle going on between wanting to be well and feeling better, but not actually managing to, you know, put, put, put everything in place in order to sort of live that way. Do you find, do, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you find that you're often telling your clients things that they don't know or they sort of already knew it but you've just almost you're helping to order things for them and, and actually just reinforce something that they they sort of knew but just didn't have the courage to change uh actually i'm surprised to to, to say because i suppose you know we're so entrenched i'm so entrenched in nutrition that i kind of figure everyone knows this stuff but uh it always astonishes me how my clients will sit there and they don't they don't know they're not aware of their patterns they're not aware of their behavior yeah. they're not aware of what's going on like you know one client of mine that comes to mind um she she was really trying trying her best and she said you know i'm just hardly eating anything why am i why am i two stone overweight i hardly eat i was like oh, you do know that you do actually need to eat yeah. <laughs> you do actually need a, a, a vast amount of nutrients each day in order to be well and to thrive and maybe you're not losing weight because you're actually depriving your body so much. And she just she 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 was astounded, and she left with permission to eat and wow. uh, with a meal plan that gave her three proper meals a day. And that's that's actually sorry. I'm sort of going off. I keep going off track from you asking about the common threads in my clinical no, practice, but just to bring up my um, the positive nutrition pyramid from my book, which is why I kind of recreated it because 
like I said earlier, those I noticed that people were just focusing. I think we had it from the eighties. Women or people in general were just like on a fat-free diet, and then it became about carb-free, and then it became about gluten-free, and then it became about sugar-free, and then it's like everyone was just focusing on what to avoid, and no one was focusing on what we actually need to eat. And we actually need to eat quite a lot. And believe it or not, to some people, it's a shock to people. We need to eat every single day in order for us to thrive and be well in all areas of our life. And so the positive nutrition pyramid is to show people just, I mean, it's a, it, obviously we're all unique. We can't be gen- general with it all, but it was a sort of general based on a modified Mediterranean diet. Um, it's brilliant. What, what we need to be eating on a daily basis to remind people that we need to be eating fruits and vegetables because we know that majority of people in the UK aren't even achieving their five portions of fruits and vegetables a day. They're not getting any healthy fats. Uh, a lot of people are really dehydrated, not getting enough fluids. Uh, some people are eating too much fruit. Some people are eating none. So the pyramid is, is like a tick box where you can just go through your day and tick and see at the end of the day oh I actually haven't eaten enough which is what most people feed back to me they realize that they've had you know lots of bread but they actually have only had one vegetable and no fruit and one glass of water (laughs) I remember when I first saw that 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 there's a beautiful graphic illustration of your positive nutrition pyramid in your book which I think is is lovely because it really helps um, illustrate to people what they should be having or Mm. or or, Or could be or could be having on any given day and you know, yeah, I agree with you. We can't generalize for everyone, but it's a pretty good template that can be individualized and personalized for whoever wants to, depending on their their preferences. And, they- and I really go into that in the book and sort of say, look, this is your diet. You must make this for you. Some of you might need more. Some of you might need less. You know, it, and I've given all of the tools so that if people read it, they'll understand how they can adapt it for them. But this is a general theme of uh, and and going back to what you say, the common threads in clinic, and I think this has really shaped. My my career is, you know, I, I've worked with all sorts of people with all different kinds of symptoms and seen 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 many different challenges. And what I kept coming back to was, it's you know, it's about the food. People want to know what to eat, and so that was, you know, early on where I started to teach myself how to cook, and then where I started to teach clients how to cook. And some of my clients I actually cooked for and filled their fridges just because. Well, we know this complicated science, we know the autoimmune uh, potential and we, we can see red flags when we work with a client and, and see sure. p- what's going on with them. They don't necessarily need to know that. They just need to know what to eat for breakfast or for supper that day. And so I've always just tried to, I know it's, it's a hugely complex area and obviously we can't simplify it, but I've tried to simplify it in a positive way and just help people engage with, with their food because if they get that right, it's amazing how much else falls into place. And then if they've still got a symptom, that's what you work with. That's that's what you need to address yeah. and dig a little deeper. And so if people are just eating a bit better, um, it, it, it makes it makes the whole process a lot. So what should people be eating, Amelia? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what would you recommend they eat? So from the positive nutrition pyramid, which I spent a long time, um, you know, look, looking into into it, uh, I, I started with hydration first because I was seeing I, I fall into this category. I can easily forget to drink water. Uh, and have a sip of my water go. as you say and, that. <laughs> um, and I think when I talk with clients, a lot of people say that they're, they're suddenly aware that they that they're pretty dehydrated and that they might remember the coffees or the teas, but they're not actually remembering just some glasses of water or herbal teas. And I have pointed out that, you know, coffee and tea is still a form of fluid. And so yeah. it's not saying you can't have those, but it's just being being aware that, you know, we need a bit of a bit of variety and that it shouldn't all be ca- caffeine. Um, so I have got um, eight glasses of water, which is the sort of standard advice. Uh, some people might need more, some people might need less, but it's a good it's a good, it's good diet. starting, it's a good points, starting yeah. point. And if you actually, you can print off the pyramid from my website and if you actually have it on your desk and just tick it throughout the day, it really helps remind you that you need a bit more water and the difference that that can make in just like mental clarity and energy and and mood, I, I think, is is vast. I think that's brilliant. Guys, just for, for those of you who, who just heard what Amelia said, I'd really encourage that you go onto her website and print it out because it's a really helpful guide to... You know, if you're struggling with your nutrition, you want a bit more of a template, a bit more of a guide on what you should be doing. I think that can be a great resource. So we will be putting um, links to to that in the show notes. You can go to the show notes page afterwards, which will be dotschatty.com forward slash Amelia. And you will be able to see all the things that me and Amelia have discussed and all those links uh, just to make it a bit easier for you. Thank you. And just to um, 
just to remind that, that the reason I've called this the positive nutrition pyramid is because it's not about shaming and making you feel bad if you don't achieve it. I don't achieve the positive nutrition pyramid every single day, but it's just meant to be a sort of nice template to help us connect with it and help us think about it in a positive way and actually realise that we can eat more food and it's not about being starving. And that's that you know that's not the, the way to lose weight or to be healthy. So you start off with hydration. So I start off with the bottom, hydration and, and then, and then I go with vegetables because I genuinely believe, like I'm always asked if you could just give people one a bit of advice I always just say it's eat more vegetables because I don't think that can do any harm to anyone I don't think um, and uh, I we, we know that we our diets need to be predominantly plant-based so uh, I've got six portions of vegetables and I try to tell people to go for the rainbow make sure you've got some leafy greens and try yeah. and get some colors in, in in there too and then I've got three portions of fruit um, again as a rem- like we know that we need fruit we know that it's beneficial but we don't need vast amounts of fruit and I think sometimes people can go a bit crazy with fruit juices and smoothies etc so do you prioritize vegetables over fruits I do yeah, I do likewise yeah and I actually find personally in, in clinic that um when people are trying to hit their five a day let's say they will often if they are having anything they'll often be having fruit super sweet fruits I agree I've met f- people that say they have five bananas done my five a day yeah exactly and I so I feel that I'm not anti-fruit at all. I think fruit can be a very helpful part of a, of a, of a you know, a, of a healthy diet, basically. Um, but I always prioritise vegetables because I think that's what people yes. aren't eating enough. And that's that's what I always encourage as well. Um, so okay, yes. so we've gone for hydration. Then you go to vegetables. Then up to fruit. And we've got some fruit. And so I, t- I say it's best to split your fruits up a- a- across the day as opposed to have it all at once, which yeah. I think is just a kind of sensible sensible way. Uh, And then it's protein, because as a nutritional therapist, that's always been the sort of main key when I look at at my clients' food diaries is they're always not eating enough protein. Um, So I always encourage people to have a little bit of protein with every meal. And you can choose your protein sources, doesn't have to be animal protein. But making sure that you've got some protein, it doesn't have to, I mean, I'm not promoting any extreme diets here, or even anything with a name, it doesn't have to be high protein, it's just a little bit of protein. And for people listening who are not sure about protein, what are some of the foods that can give them protein. So I would always say, you know, going for the healthy options. So the plant-based proteins such as pulses like chickpeas and lentils, uh, nuts and seeds, tofu, um, and then the animal protein. So some some nice uh, fish or some lean meat or poultry. Um, and then you've got the, the dairy aspect. So some good quality, uh, you know, non-sugared, uh, full fat yogurt or, or cheeses. Yeah, I think that's all the proteins and, and got, eggs, of course. Eggs and eggs, of great. course. Yeah, and I think protein is, you know, it really helps fill people up, doesn't it? It's it, it's great for stabilizing blood sugar. And uh, yes, I always notice people that say they're always hungry. Usually, they're quite they're quite low on their proteins. And and I, I, f- something that I've really observed is if I start my day on protein. My day goes really, really well, and I can. And I've noticed that if I start my day on just like a cart, like something like porridge, by the by four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm craving something sweet or I'm craving some kind of carbs. Yeah, I think I mean that's such a great point because um, in the so question, porridge can work for some people as a good breakfast, but I see many patients who it doesn't work particularly well for. It leaves them feeling a bit empty, always craving. They're always hungry from ten o'clock in the morning. Um, I think it's fine if you marry it with a bit of protein, which is what I'm always saying. So add in some peanut butter or some almond butter or some milk or some yogurt or some flaxseed or some some chopped nuts, anything just to balance out that, that, that carb. So you've got some protein there near the top of the pyramids, but we're not quite at the very top yet, are we? Because you've got a few more layers to go. So then I've got the complex carbs. Uh, this is always, you know, uh, hugely debatable with, with people. Um, I'm not anti-carbs. I think that we, we need carbohydrates, but obviously, if, and for me, it's not even about the quantity, it's the quality. So I always say go for whole foods. So uh, here in the picture, we've got some sweet potato and we've got some oats. Uh, and really, I'm just trying to advise people to steer away from or, you know, reduce the the white refined processed carbs that we know are, are lacking in nutrients and yeah. not beneficial for our health. Um, for some people, if they're really sedentary or they're struggling with thyroid issues or metabolism issues, they maybe don't need the carbs, that that those parts of the pyramid. For people that are really active, they probably need more. So this is not trying to, this is probably the most negotiable part of the pyramid. Sure. Um, it, and, and it's really down to individuals to try and experiment and see what works for them. Great. And then at the very top? And then I've got healthy fats. Um, so 
again, I'm not really promoting a high fat diet, but we know that we need some healthy fats. And by that, I mean the natural fat. So I've got a quarter of an avocado and a tablespoon of olive oil. And that's all we really need uh, in a day. Some people can be fine with more. Again, it depends on their activity levels. But I like to get it in there just to remind people that we do need some healthy fats. And then at the very top, I've got a portion of nuts and seeds because uh, they can marry up as some healthy fats and protein. And we know that they're just nutritional powerhouses. So just having a small portion, which is about eight nuts. So that's what I mean by a portion on the part the palm of your hand is a good guide. Yeah, it's it's a really helpful guide that, and I'm I can see why you're so proud of it because I think it can, it's got the potential to really help a lot of people. Well, the feedback that I get from people is they they do find it incredibly useful to to just give give them a guide and and you know I say like write the other stuff if you have a Kit Kat or a glass of red wine write it in the top corner and you know it's not the naughty corner there's nothing wrong with having those things too it's your choice if you want to add cake onto this but that's not nutritional. Yeah. And you've got to make sure that you're aiming to have, you know, everything that we've talked about in the pyramid, there's a purpose. It's for your nutrition. It's for your health. It's necessary to eat all of those things. I think that's great the way you, you the way you explain that. It's like this is this is almost like your base requirement exactly. to fuel your body every day. Yeah. If you want to have some treats on top of that. That's your choice. That's your choice. Yeah. But you're focusing on the positive nature mm. of food and, and what it can do to us. And, and you are right but that there's been this real move about restricting things and cutting things out. And Again, you know, some people have got a very good reason for cutting out certain food groups. There's no question about that. You know, that gets demonised as well. Absolutely. And I, I mean, feel very sorry for those people because yeah. actually I often in clinics sometimes can see quite clearly that a patient is reacting to a certain food group. Yeah. And often with a, a short term uh, elimination, they can feel a lot better. And then we can figure out how we're going to manage that long term. But Yes. You know. and, and obviously for all of my nutritional therapy um, friends out there, you know, I, I, it, um, I'm so pleased that you brought that up because obviously we do in practice often work with elimination diets and they're really beneficial and important for people. But I suppose what I've learned is when you're talking in a general way, such as a book, you can't be that specific. And so <laughs> I think, uh, you know, that that's why I tried to do it in a positive way. And, and actually all of the book is gluten free and dairy free because that's the way that I eat because that's just what I found suits me and I challenge that all the time and I change it up and I'm not a, I'm not afraid of those foods but um I, I don't make a big thing about the fact that that's what this book is about because it's I'm talking about positivity um but yes it, it there are lots of people that do benefit from removing certain foods, but hopefully they're doing it with the support of a qualified practitioner Absolutely, so that no they're question. doing it in a sensible way and they're not resorting to processed gluten-free foods or junk foods and that they're not missing vital nutrients from their diet. Yeah, and the other thing I, I'd sort of emphasise, and I, I've heard you talk about this before as well, Amelia, is that you know if you are in a certain state of health and your gut is... You know, not doing so well. Your microbiome probably isn't, possibly isn't in the best shape that it that it that it could be. Often, you can be more reactive to foods, and often when you do a short term elimination, yeah. do some work on your lifestyle, your nutrition, yeah. your sleep, your stress levels. You know, um, increase the amount of colourful vegetables in your diet, and yes. bit by bit starts to change your gut health and your microbiome. Mm. It is amazing how many things you can tolerate mm. that you couldn't tolerate in the past. And I've experienced that myself. You yes, know, me too. My, my gut is in a lot better shape than it was even even probably two years ago. Yes, yes. Um, I've got to say a lot of that started with nutrition, but a lot of it's from actually something you, you mentioned at the start, which is that emotional work. Mm. It's amazing that actually... I've I've gone on a bit of a journey doing a lot of emotional work on myself. Um, That's fantastic, and it and it feels great. And that in itself, you know, lowering your own stress levels that has an impact on your gut health. Oh, um, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, certainly from not sorry to interrupt no, you, but please. from from my you know becoming a new mum is definitely quite quite stressful and and quite challenging. And I've noticed the impact that. That that's had on on my on my health. Um, you know, there I was. I went into it quite healthy, feeling like, yeah, I've got this nailed. Uh, and then suddenly, you go through a, a new change in life, which is you know losing vast amounts of sleep, which was my 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 crux. You know, and having someone reliance on you. Yes, like, totally yes. reliant. So and, I, and learning all of these new things, and and thinking every day, God, am I doing this right? Like, there's no manual on how to be a parent. Well, this I think this is interesting for people that, you know, Amelia Freer, the nutritional therapist, the best-selling author, you know, you know, there's probably a perception that you had it all down with your nutrition, which is no. possibly not correct either. No. Um, but what has changed since you've been a mother 
obviously you're exhausted a lot of the time. You've been telling yeah. me about that, and I totally yeah. resonate with that. Um, you know, do you get sometimes when you're that tired, you think, oh, I can't be bothered cooking a fresh meal. I just want something quick. Absolutely. I found this year to be incredibly eye-opening and challenging for me. I mean, and, I, and when I say that, I, like, I don't beat my... I'm, I've never been someone that beats myself up over food choices. I've never been obsessive or sort of neurotic about it. I, I've, I've always embraced nutrition in a kind of joyful way. And I should just say that, you know, obviously being a new mum is incredible and I'm I'm not meaning to whinge about it, but I think it's important that we talk about the reality of, of just how much sleep a, a new mum loses and what an impact that has on on their well-being because because I I've experienced it firsthand and I'm horrified I did not know or understand and I was never empathetic enough. Uh, now that I've gone through it, I'm you know I have so much respect for for mums and 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 how they function. But um, it, it it's impacted my digestive health. I feel like I've kind of gone back to square one. I'm having to do a lot of work on my microbiome. I'm taking probiotics. Um, uh, you know I I I found breastfeeding made me so hungry i've never experienced a hunger like it and and i was just craving sugar like i i, <laughs> I the the sugar went back into my tea did it? How many did you get up to? Only one. Only one. Only one. But, but it, it was, went back in. That's it interesting. It went back in. And, you know, I kind of thought, OK, I'll just do this for a week and then, you know, and one. then another week and then another week. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, and I'm not ashamed to 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 share that. I think, you know, it's it, it this this kind of thing is normal. There's no there's no shame in it. Um, but it took quite a while for me to kind of wean myself off that habit. And I blame the hospital because they bought me a sweet cup of tea after I'd given, <laughs> given birth. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. But um, I, I found that I was really craving, you know, fast processed sugars because, and it was the breastfeeding that was making me do it. I was eating every two hours. Um, so that was a that was completely new to me. I've always been the girl that doesn't snack and doesn't have any sugar. Yeah. And, you know, that was That's turned. real life, right? Absolutely. Um, but that also goes to you, Amelia, you, you, I've heard you talk about your approach in nutrition before. I think you've, I think I've often heard you use the term uh, fluid and flexible, I yes, think. Is yes, that right? Yes. Yeah, I, I think always, you just demonstrated that there. Yeah. That it has to be fluid and flexible because life constantly changes. Nothing is static. Exactly. Our symptoms change, our circumstances change, and we have to, we have to adapt and respond. And I think, you know, the, there's, there's probably a lot of people that t take healthy eating in, in quite an extreme way and it becomes quite, uh, uh, you know, obsessive for them and they panic and they would never have a spoonful of sugar in their tea. Um, and, and I don't think that that's healthy. I think if it's if it's stressing you, if it's if it's a form of control all the time, I'm not sure that that's that that healthy. You know, I think that food's important, but as you talk about a lot, our stress is important too. And and so I, I haven't beaten myself up over the food choices that I've made over in the first few months of, of being is, a mum while I was breastfeeding. Is the sugar still there in your tea? No, I'm slowly working my way. No, <laughs> no, no, the, su the sugar's gone. And I, I feel like now I'm probably much more engaged again in sort of microbiome gut health because there are some things that I need to work on and certainly my hormonal health needs a bit of work. So, uh, you know, it, it uh, and the acne came back for a while. You Did know, it's it? all wow. been it's all been turned on its on its head which which I I think is 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 fascinating and just a reminder that it doesn't matter, you know, health is not a destination. It's a it's a constantly fluid yeah, I think that this can be incredibly reassuring for some people listening. You know, particularly if you, if anyone's listening and they, you know, they've got young kids or they're pregnant and they're struggling to mm. make, or you know, it could even be work pressures. It could be a whole number of reasons why people are struggling. That's okay. You know, it's mm. it's it can be challenging to do this all the time. Yeah, and I guess. What I'm trying to do with this podcast is to get on a whole wide variety of guests to hopefully inspire everyone listening that actually it is possible to make those changes. It is possible to have a fuller life. And the reason, Amelia, I call this Feel Better, Live More is I genuinely believe is that, you know, when we're feeling better in ourselves, we get more out of life. Yeah. Um, I think nutrition and lifestyle is, is, a, is a really great way to do that. Um, I mean, you mentioned... You grow your own vegetables, and I do know that. Yes. I'm just, it made me wonder, you know, it's one of the issues now in society that we've lost that complete connection between what food is, where it comes from. You know, mm. often we're buying things in packets or in, in shops. We, we, we don't actually understand where that food actually came from. Do mm. you think growing your own vegetables has brought you closer to food and has helped you make better food choices? Um, I wouldn't. 
uh, I, I don't think it's helped me make better food choices because I was making good food choice, uh, you know, the right food choices. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say the right. I was making good food choices sure. um, before growing vegetables. But it has certainly brought me um, much more in, in connection with it. And, and like what's available seasonally, you know, just, just sort of, yeah, I just used to take for granted if I felt like asparagus, I'd just go out and buy asparagus. And now I understand that asparagus is a, an incredibly short season. It's maybe three weeks and, uh, you know, you get an abundance of it, but the rest of the year it doesn't grow and figs are just in season in my garden now. And so I've been enjoying fresh figs. And so oh, it's, wow. it's uh, and, and, you know, the pumpkins are ready and I just love being in touch with how the seasons change and provide what we actually need, uh, you, you know, as 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 the as the weather changes and and you know, like autumn, suddenly we've got access to all of these lovely starchy foods that that we lend themselves perfectly to lovely comforting stews and. Yeah, I think for you, although it didn't change things for you, I think I see a big problem out there, and I probably would argue that I've been. I've struggled with this in the past. You know, I don't think I was necessarily brought up with that connection with where that food comes from. No, yeah. And and I think it's it's something, I'm not saying I'm doing a great job at it, but it's something I'm definitely trying to instill with my children is to mm. have that real understanding of where this where this all comes from mm. and, um, you know, living in harmony with nature as much as possible. I think these things are really important, actually. Yes. Um, there's so, there's just... I mean, I, I, I'm incredibly privileged to be growing my vegetables. I, I know that it's not, it's, it's really time consuming and it's not, it's not that easy, but um, it's, there's just something so wonderful about going out and picking it and taking it in and eating it. And I have so much more appreciation for that courgette or that tomato yeah. or that aubergine or lettuce. You know what? I, lettuce. I, I grew up with a greenhouse in my garden. My dad, you know, he was working incredibly hard. He was a, he was a doctor. And he'd always be doing nights, working weekends. He wouldn't be around that much. But when he was back, I, I remember seeing Dad for hours in the garden. I've not thought about this for a long time, actually. Yeah. You know, and it's nice to think about this because my dad passed away about five years ago, and um, he used to love growing tomatoes and courgettes. Once he grew grapes, and then he, he went on this project in the loft to make his own wine. And oh, I love you know, that. I didn't quite get it at the time, you know. But now I'm no, craving that myself. Yes. I'm craving, oh, I'd love yeah. to get my own greenhouse now and actually There's grow my own veg. so therapeutic about it. I mean, when I'm stressed, I go into the garden and everything is all right again. I just there's there's something really like you. I mean, it sounds really cringy, but it's just being connecting with nature. Na nature is key. I mean, there's a whole, you know, we, we were speaking about before about my book on stress, which comes out in a, in a couple mm. of months, and you know, there's a whole chapter on nature in it, and you know, I really try and make the case that nature is the antidote to modern technology. Yeah. It's the complete opposite. And again, tech's not going anywhere. You know, tech's yes. here. It's got so many great benefits. But I think we're hardwired to be in nature. And I think we do have a nature deficiency as a society, mm -hmm. many of us. And I do think going in nature is... Um, is an incredible way to just reconnect with, with foods, with yourself. It, you know, the study showing that just being in nature lowers your cortisol levels. Yes. Cortisol, one of the main stress hormones, goes down when we're in nature. Even when we look at a picture of nature, our cortisol levels can go down. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? I can I can definitely say firsthand it, it worked for me moving to the country and just taking some time out and away from work and London and busy, 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 and just being in nature. It was it was just for, for people who don't live in the country. I mean, I'm I'm not a expert vegetable grower so i'm not sure um if i can add some expertise here but are there things that they can do in if they don't live in the country about growing their own vegetables oh, i would definitely say you know on a window box or even in your kitchen you know herbs would be the first place to start because they, they're they're really rewarding they grow pretty easily and then you can just add add them to all of your food and which will just take the food up to another level um then i would say tomatoes are pretty good if you've got a little outside space wow um and um hmm, what else what else Lettuces, like you lettuces, can eat, yeah. yeah, it's so. I did that with my kids recently. I know it's easy. It is super easy to grow lettuce. It is. It is. There's something so pleasurable. Like earlier this year, I would just do little rows, and then every week I would do a new row of beetroot, or, and then just watching it germinating and. Becoming... Oh, brilliant! Hey guys, if anyone's listening to something, then they actually are doing any of this with vegetables in the garden or with window boxes. Please do, you know, snap a shot, tag me and Amelia yes. on their social media. Let us know. <laughs> We'd love to see what you guys are doing I think with we that. We should all start growing more veggies. Yeah, and the more we should, you know, this is this is where social media can be a really positive yeah. um, medium for change. If everyone's 
start sharing these photos, you know, it's very encouraging for other people to start saying, oh, I can do that. So I think we should start a campaign to do that. Yes, I love it. I Um, love it. Spread a bit of joy. Absolutely. Um, I'm just trying to think, you know, that's, we've kind of bit off track. I didn't, I didn't quite know where we were going to go with this conversation, but I've actually had a lot of fun, but it's just gone. (laughs) I've loved it, but yes, we have gone down a few few roads. (laughs) In terms of bringing it back to practical tips, um, I heard you recently talk about pre-chopped onions. Oh, yes. yeah. And, and I found it incredible because I tell you, when I, in my first book, The Four Pivot Plan, um, I remember I wrote this chart of tips to help you in, in the house. I can't remember what I called it, actually. And I never thought that pre-chopped onions or pre-chopped garlic would be useful for anyone, right? And one of my patients came in and told me, oh, I find it so useful to have that. And I, oh. I actually buy it and I keep it yeah. there and it means that I'm much more likely to cook a fresh meal when I, when I don't have to go to all the yes. hassle of chopping it. And yeah. I thought, okay, well, you know, fair enough, that works. Uh, that I'm, I'm going to openly admit that's not what I do, but my one of my patients told me that. But then I heard you <laughs> say that you do this as well. Well, because, you know, I've, I've, I've perfected most of my recipes around helping clients over the years. And a lot of my clients are just too, too busy or they're, they're not that confident in the kitchen. And you know what, if you've just got a bag of chopped onions in the freezer... And, and that means that you can have a vegetable curry made. I mean, of course, we know it doesn't take very long to chop an onion. No, sure. But it puts sometimes the, the tears put people off. Sometimes people just, I don't know, don't think that they have the time. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I do. I do use it. I mean, I, I grow my own onions and I do chop my own onions. No, myself, I think it's great. But, but I but I always have some frozen chopped herbs, some frozen chopped garlic, some frozen chopped chilli, some frozen chopped ginger and some frozen chopped onions in the freezer at all times. And you can rustle up a curry in about five minutes if you have those things available. Right, I'm coming around. You're going to have to teach me how to do this. This is uh, just Done. incredible. I mean, I think, guys, that is a fantastic tip. It's, I must admit, it's not something I do, but... You might. I might now. I'm going to try and do that now. And um, just to hear you say that that's how you do it, I think that's incredibly inspirational for people. So that's not sort of... They can still make a, a freshly cooked meal at home, yeah. but they're not having to do it all than anything, I think, that can remove the obstacle to getting people to eat well. I think it's a good thing. I, I, I agree. And again, it's not about being perfect. I mean, of course, the, the I don't know how much nutrition stays in and I'm not sure that the flavour would be the same. It's all, Fresh is always better. But sometimes it's, it's just about getting... probably better than eating out. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or, or a, you know, a, a ready-made meal that's been, that has a very long shelf life and is wrapped in plastic. Yeah. I think that's a great tip, actually, and uh, I'd, I'd be super interested for for any of the listeners who who actually uses that themselves. Do let do let us know on social media. We'd love to hear who uses that tip as well. Um, Amelia, I've had a fascinating conversation today. Just to try and wrap it up now, one thing, you know, one of one of the things I'm really trying to do with um, everything I do in the media, with books, with this podcast is. I want to inspire every single person listening to become the architects of their own health. And I always love to leave them with some take-homes. And I, I wonder, from your perspective, um, because I talk about four pillars in my yes. book, I always talk about four tips. Yes. And okay. I wonder if you have four top tips for people listening to this podcast that they can implement to improve the quality of their of their, well, improve their health, which in mm. turn will improve the quality of their lives. Um, I suppose this changes all the time and it does change according to who, you, who you're speaking to. But I generally, I, I, I've said it already, eat more vegetables. I think if everyone can just focus on adding an extra portion of vegetables, even just a day or maybe to a couple of meals, I really believe that that's going to to influence their health. On, on that, before you get to point number two, yeah. can I just ask you, have you got any top tips to help people make vegetables more attractive for them to eat because many people i mean i love vegetables yeah but some people think oh it's a bit boring have you got any any tips for people to- i think um good quality olive oil yeah really helps just what just a drizzle on the veg yeah just yeah. have a little drizzle of good quality olive oil and i think fresh herbs like i'll add some chives to some spinach and that just some you know so spinach with a little bit of black pepper some chives and some olive oil that's yeah, to it's me, incredible, to me, isn't delicious. it? Delicious, or you know, herbs and spices. So, like, you know, roasting broccoli with some cumin or coriander—that's lovely. Or turmeric makes a huge um, difference, I rather think, than just a steamed. I think flavors yeah. uh, make a, make a big difference, but I always think it's just the idea, and actually, it still is really tasty once you eat it. But I think flavors. So yeah. eat more veg and don't neglect spices and herbs mm. to, as a way to bringing out those flavors. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, my second tip, I haven't really thought about this, but I suppose my second tip, and again, we've touched on it, and it's not really about food, but it's something that I believe to be really important f- for all of the clients that I've worked with over the years, is don't be afraid to tackle your emotional health. Don't be afraid to have the difficult conversations, um, because I think that that is the crux of of you know, most of our happiness and, and health and that that can influence our food choices or our life choices. Yeah, absolutely. I so I think totally that that's agree, Amelia. really important. Um, I think my third tip would be uh, cooking from scratch, just encouraging people to to have the confidence. You know, you don't have to be as amazing as Jamie Oliver or uh, these wonderful chefs. Uh, it doesn't have to be to, to their standard, but um y- have a go get in get in the kitchen and try cooking as many meals as you can from scratch and and enjoy it don't 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 approach it you know thinking that that it has to be complex and lengthy and and perfect because you know, it, it might not always taste amazing but it doesn't matter it's going to be okay yeah and i think that trying to take the perfectionism out of of cooking is quite important yeah i think making it fun's a great point to me and one thing i've started doing is i've got this cd player this old school cd player in the kitchen <laughs> and i actually Actually, it's almost a bit of me time sometimes to actually yes. put on like an old album that I've not heard in a while, put the music on and just just be there in the kitchen and try and make something. I think um, it's a joy. It's, it really yeah. is. It can be. It can be a really fun experience. Yeah. And that that's always how I've approached it. I mean, in the past, it w- I would always put on some lovely jazz and it was just like my happy place to be in the kitchen and rustle up some food. Uh, that definitely has changed since becoming a mum because there just isn't the same time. But I still, <laughs> when I get the time, like when Willow goes down for a sleep and I just think, oh, I've got an hour in the kitchen to myself. I'm going to cook, and and I think that brings me on to the the fourth point, which is for me, cooking is quite a sort of meditative process. But a couple of years ago, I did actually learn to meditate, and 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 I found that to be transformational to my health. And there's not a single client that I work with in that I will work with in the future that I won't recommend it to. Um, I know not everyone um, aspires to nutrition, or a lot of people have the 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 idea that it that that it's really difficult and that you have to sit in a cross legged position and go arm and chant and maybe have long hair and light joss sticks and and um, I learned from someone who just is the opposite to that and having that as a tool now to help me when I'm a bit stressed or when I'm a bit down or when I'm overtired like when Willow hasn't slept uh, meditation has become a really useful tool for me and I think I just want to encourage everyone to just give it a go. Had you tried to meditate for a while before you actually finally made it a practice? Yes, I had. And I always believed that I couldn't do it because my mind was too busy and my mind was wandering and it wouldn't stay still and it wouldn't stay quiet. Common things that um, everyone thinks, right? Yeah. And, and uh, so I, I really, you know, was quite harsh on myself. just thought, I can't do it. I've got a really busy head. Um, and it was such a liberation. I learned from a lady called Gillian Lavender, who runs the London Meditation Centre. And uh, she used to be in the corporate world. And so she's just approaches it from a very normal angle. And when she, when when I said, my head's just too busy, she went, that's brilliant. Welcome it. Yeah. Let the chatter come. Let the thoughts come. And I was like, what? Yes. That's not meditation. <laughs> that's incredible to hear that. Um, in fact, I did a podcast a few episodes ago with Light Watkins uh, yes. in America. Yes. And he's, again, you know, I, I don't know you know, if it's exactly the same approach or not, but he very much embraces the busy mind as well. Mm. So good, you know, that's, you know, you've got to embrace that. No, you're not trying to shut that down. That's where your mind is at the moment. We'll work with that. And he also, um, he was the first person to really say, you don't need to have a straight back, you know, or, you know, he's like, you know, if you don't spend your life with a straight back, you know, then most people who try and sit there and cross side having a straight back so and not uncomfortable. all they're thinking about is how do I maintain this posture for ten or twenty minutes? Yeah, exactly. um, and so he, you know, I, if you guys haven't heard that episode, I really encourage you to listen to that because light really has helped me change my meditation practice. Oh, um, you know, I've, I've I've been up and down with it for years. I always tried. I go through the good time where I do it for maybe ten days and then I ah, oh, you know, I, I slip off again. Yeah. But light has really helped me take the pressure off things. And it sounds as though you've also had a great instructor to help you. Well, she expl- a, a lovely way to think of it was she was she said that um, thoughts were like a stream. And so you're watching the stream flowing and then a little leaf might come down. And that's a thought that comes. You just let it go. And then, you know, a stick comes along and then a fish or something. It's just allowing your thoughts to come and go and not feeling that you have to shut them down. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, those are four fantastic tips. We'll see if I can remember them. Eat more veg, <laughs> work on your emotional health, mm. cook as much as you can, 
And finally, you know, try and get a practice of meditation. Uh, I think these are such beautiful tips that are going to help mm. all the, the listeners to this podcast. Amelia, I've really enjoyed chatting to you oh, it's today. Been so lovely chatting to you. Thank you for, um, you know, taking some time out of your schedule. And, um, you know, I wish you all the well with motherhood Thank and you. the next few months, the next few years. I hope we can catch up again soon. And yeah, thanks very much for coming on. Thank you. That concludes today's episode of the Feel Better, Live More podcast. I hope you liked those four tips from Amelia at the end. I know I certainly did. I hope you found the conversation enjoyable and it's hopefully inspired you to make a few changes in your own health. Don't forget, do let me and Amelia know what you thought about the conversation. And indeed, if you have taken any tips from it that you're going to put into practice, do let us know on social media do tag both of us and if possible use the hashtag feel better live more don't forget the full show notes for this episode are available on my website at drchastity.com forward slash amelia where there are lots of other links that you can access to continue your learning experience if you are so inclined Guys, if you got something out of today's conversation, please do help me spread awareness. The best ways are to leave a review on whichever platform you are listening to this now on, such as Apple or Acast, or you could take a screenshot on your phone right now and share it on your social media channels, or you could do it the old-fashioned way and just let your mates know about the podcast. I would really appreciate any help that you can give me to spread awareness, so thank you very much. One of Amelia's tips in our conversation today was about starting a meditation practice, something that she said has been truly transformative in her life. Now, if meditation is something that you have tried to do before, but struggle to maintain a practice, I would highly recommend that you listen to episode 23 of this podcast, The Truth About Meditation, which you can find on any podcast application, or go to my website and you can listen to the whole episode at drchatterjee.com forward slash light Watkins. Don't forget to visit the sponsor page to help support the show, athleticgreens.com forward slash live more, where you can order what I genuinely think is a great product. I know that many of you are already familiar with my first book, The Four Pillar Plan. For those of you who are new to the podcast, please consider picking up a copy. It is also available in America and Canada with the title, How to Make Disease Disappear. I'm also delighted to let you know that my second book, The Stress Solution, is out in just a couple of months and is available to pre-order now. Links to all of these books are on the show notes page at drchastity.com forward slash Amelia. Guys, that is it for today. I hope you have a fabulous week. Make sure you have pressed subscribe and I will see you in about one week for the next conversation on my Feel Better, Live More podcast. Remember, you are the architect of your own health. Making lifestyle change is always worth it because when you feel better, you live more. I'll see you next time.